Hey everybody, welcome to week seven. I have several things I want you to listen to this week. Um, this lecture plus three demos, which I've posted on Canvas. So there's a lot of listening to me and there's some reading, namely um, chapter seven of the craft text. Um, and then there's an exercise. So let me get right into this so I don't take up too much of your time. Okay, so why are we doing this? This comes from chapter uh, seven of craft and chapter seven of craft is talking about economic and budgetary policy. Well, um, there's actually some mistakes in this chart from page um, 255 of the text and I circle those in red because they're important. This, this shows uh, for the 2017 budget, um, federal uh, revenues and federal expenses or expenditures. So it says revenue was proposed to be 3.64 trillion and expenses were proposed to be 4.15 trillion. So that has uh, changed a little bit, um, but the difference now is uh, expenditures have continued to rise. We're actually getting a little bit less in revenue. So if you if you read what the CBO CBO has done in its analysis, what you find is that um, it projects that our deficits are going to increase for the next. 10 years um, and so but basically this is a pattern that we've had in the United States since the early 1970s where in expenditures outstrip revenues um, and in fact um, we've talked about that in this course that we've had a difficult time trying to get those two to balance the mistake uh, in with those red ovals around them are that individual income taxes is should be actually one comma seven hundred, so that would be one point seven trillion dollars, and Social Security and other payroll taxes would be one point one four zero trillion dollars. Um, so what that's saying is that the the lion's share of revenue uh, in a single category for the United States happens to be income taxes. Uh, Corporate income taxes are high, but but individual income taxes, um, you know, for all income earners, are the largest share of revenue. And then Social Security and payroll taxes really go to support Social Security and Medicare, primarily. And compare that with the expenses, um, and you can see, as we've discussed before, that Social Security, um, defense, and other mandatory programs. Uh, and Medicare take up the lion's share of the expenditure side. So when we start talking about uh, government spending, um, we can talk about things like, uh, you know, foreign uh, assistance. But but really, um, really the, the the three big areas of Social Security, um, defense, and health along with other mandatory programs really take up most of the budget. And so um, as we address policy, at least at the national level, we certainly are going to address economic impacts of all policy. So I put this slide up here to talk about this week's exercise. So take a look at this. Um, I'll talk about it more at the end. Um, what this is going to do is this exercise is going to make sense to you after you look at this lecture and after you look at the demos this exercise is going to make sense to you hopefully and you'll be able to do it uh, and i'm asking you also to let me know uh, if you have problems doing the exercise so for this week um, as i said use this lecture as well as the video demos so also use some of the links and websites and explanatory documents that I provided. I gave you several supplemental readings this week. Um, some you can just kind of glance at, but they'll also come in handy for you later. Um, so take a look at the supplemental readings. Take a look at all the, the demos. If you look at the Canvas site right now, you'll you'll say, gosh, he's given us a lot to read. But, but really, it, it should make sense to you. Um, and as you wind your way through it, I think it'll make more sense when you get to the exercise. Um, so here's the point about government websites. Most of them are reliable. Um, and most of them uh, are really a great source of data. And most of them actually are updated 
by some <laughs> very competent people. Um, the United States Census Bureau is staffed by some some very good uh, academic demographers and statist statisticians. Uh, the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics are both staffed by uh, trained and degreed and uh, published economists. And so the information that you read, that you get from those sources is, is really highly reliable. And I would add other sites too. Um, we don't look at the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, for example, in this class. Um, but their websites are maintained by climatologists and meteorologists and oceanographers who really are experts in their field. So um, kind of the, the old saw that, you know, government really doesn't know what it's doing. I, I would I take issue with as a general proposition anyway, of course. But but I also take issue with uh, when you look at some of these sites, you will see that, that the information and the data provided is, is really quite useful. But the point is this week, we're just really gonna scratch the surface. Um, I talk about three websites and I give you three demos. We talk about the US Census, the BEA and the BLS. But again, I, I am going just a micrometer below the surface because the way to find out how to use those websites is actually to start using them. So, um, as you get into the demos, there's some common terms I want to talk about that we often use in policy analysis, but we have to understand what we're talking about when we use them. So GDP or gross domestic product, CPI or consumer price index, um, the term population and the term revenue and sources of revenue. So what is GDP? GDP briefly is the total value of all goods and services produced um, in the nation uh, or the state or a city um, for a given time period. So this is an indicator of the overall strength of the economy. And and I'll get into how it's expressed in a moment here. Then there's a CPI, which is Consumer Price Index, which is an index that indicates uh, the cost of consumer goods constructed from a hypothetical shopping basket of good. So this is an indicator of the overall rate of inflation in the economy. So the difference between CPI and, and GDP in a sense is um, CPI is an index. Um, GDP is a real number. Um, it's calculated from a lot of very complicated calculations, but it's a real number expressed in dollar numbers, um, whereas CPI is an index. And then, of course, population. So population can be indicative of many things, right? Uh, the census records the population. That was its original job. Um, but it's really an indicator of other things. So if a state is losing population, uh, you have to ask yourself why. If a state is not growing at the same rate as the rest of the states, that should prompt a question as to why. And then there's revenue and sources of revenue, because I'm going to have you look at some sources of revenue a little bit in uh, the demos and for the exercise. So the point of governments, um, in a sense, is that uh, an entity is a government because it it has been granted uh, by its by its higher level of government the power to tax. Um, so in the Constitution, uh, the the national government was given some powers of taxation, and the states were given all other powers of taxation. So typically, in states, states grant the power to tax to their subordinate political entities. And so that could be counties, it could be cities, villages, towns, it could be school districts, it could be special districts like water districts, like sanitary uh, improvement districts in the state of Nebraska, uh, like uh, rural water districts. And so all of these things are technically governments because they have the power to tax. And in many cases, they have the power to tax using property tax, but often they also have the power to tax using the other forms of taxation, such as sales tax, uh, such as fees. So for example, um, the typically uh, the parks or wildlife departments in states are given the power to tax um, based on user fees. So 
a government entity typically has the power to levy some kind of tax but what varies is the revenue the source of revenue and the purpose of the revenue so there's some pitfalls when we talk about these things um, first some pitfalls with the CPI so the CPI is actually used quite a bit um, the consumer price index actually forms the basis for things like cost of living allowances for Social Security and federal retirement programs such as civil service retirement railroad retirement uh, military retirement so the CPI is an indicator of inflation and it's based on something that is colloquially called uh, colloquially is what I meant to say commonly called the market basket so what happens is uh, surveys are done of consumers to uh, determine their purchasing preferences and so from that uh, this hypothetical market basket of goods and services is created and then each month uh, a survey is done of the prices of the items in that market basket and so from that we construct a base year which is the 100 year or the one year one times 100 and inflation generally causes the index to move up so for example if the base year of this market basket is 1983 and that's 100 then if the CPI in 2000 was 172.2 that means that it increased by 72 percent okay so what's the difference between these these kinds of CPIs so first there's a CPIU which is the most commonly used one now um, from the beginning uh, the CPI was created then it derived other forms of the CPI so the CPIU is called is stands for urban residents and it covers most urban residents in the United States and their shopping preferences um, but then there's another one called the CPIW which refers to um, urban wage earners and clerical occupations so um, the measure of that is actually looking at the worker themselves and it's based on the assumption that at least half the income of the worker um, comes from wage or clerical occupations and then there is something called the chained CPI which I give you a little uh, video from um, BLS on that but the chain CPI actually uh, does things with the weights of the items in the market basket so what it typically does is it looks at substitution items um, as inflation increases uh, for example consumers might substitute items uh, for other items so if a, a person who eats beef um, sees that the price of steak is going up they might opt for chicken and so the CPIU chained takes that into account and so typically uh, results in a, a slightly smaller CPI number it increases at a slightly lower rate than CPIU so the important thing to remember about using these is when you use a CPI make sure if you're using the CPIU compare it only to CPIU if you're using the CPIW compare it only to CPIW if you're using the chained CPI compare it only to the chained CPI um, don't compare like if you're comparing uh, you know different years and you want to know the rate of inflation make sure you understand which CPI you're using okay now let's talk about pitfalls of GDP so we hear a lot about GDP in fact we hear it all the time um, the gross domestic product is a measure of the output of the economy and so it is expressed um, as a value of all goods and services so that is the part of it that is the number so the GDP when you when we hear about it it's usually expressed as this dollar amount but also as an annual rate and and the that rate is is talked about even quarterly if um, if we hear about it right um, so we hear about the dollar term and then we also hear about the change from the previous quarter so for example in the second quarter of 2018 um, the the GDP percentage amount was 4.1 what that means is that expressed as an annual percentage the second quarter of 2018 economy grew at 4.1 percent 
the third quarter of 2018 was 3.4%. So what that means is that the GDP grew at a rate, an annual rate, for that quarter of 3.4%. So there was a 7, a 0.7% decline in the growth rate. That doesn't mean the economy wasn't growing. It just means there was a 7%, not 7%, but 0.7% decline from the previous quarter. And there are also several GDP estimates. So the, the one we hear about usually is what's called the advanced estimate. That is confusing because it's not in advance. It's actually shortly after the fact. So it's just about three or four weeks after the previous quarter. So sometime in April, the first quarter um, FY or the first quarter of 2019 GDP will be announced, but but it it's called advanced because not all the data has been gathered and measured. Then there are second and third estimates that come uh, several weeks or months after that, and then every five years, um, the BEA actually reviews all the previous data to create the historical data because what you're measuring is a very large economy with millions of items uh, of consumer goods and other and raw materials. And so uh, the data gathering, as you might imagine, is no easy task. And, and so this is why we see several estimates. So the other thing we have to understand about the GDP is whether or not the data are presented. The GDP itself is in what we call nominal dollars or current dollars versus constant or real dollars and understand the base year if it's expressed in constant dollars. So we often talk about current dollars versus constant dollars and that's something you must always keep in mind when doing a policy analysis. Whenever you're using uh, dollar figures, make sure you know whether you're talking about, for example, nominal numbers, which are dollars expressed in that current year, so 1983, 1984, 1985, and so forth, in that current year, or you are converting them to some current, to some constant year for comparative purposes. So um, there's hundreds of other indicators um, on these three websites that I talk about. Um, and the thing to know is, you know, know what you're looking at. Um, often you can see, for example, different numbers on the same set of data. So population numbers, for example, on the census are going to vary depending upon whether we're talking about the American Community Survey numbers or the every 10 year census numbers. Economic numbers such as the CPI might vary because of the different kinds of CPIs, as I discussed. Information might vary between government websites because of collection criteria. So you might see tax numbers slightly different on the census site than you would see um, elsewhere. And even within the census site, you might see tax numbers differing. And so when using that kind of data, just understand the source and how it was collected and always strive to use consistent sources of data. And then the final thing, just from an academic standpoint or a policy analysis standpoint, when the numbers aren't there, don't fudge or make them up. Uh, don't try to interpolate um, and simply say the data aren't available. But chances are the data are available. You just have to look a little more and that looking isn't always easy, but often you have to do that. So let me just talk for a couple minutes about the census. So what is this decennial census? So as I said, or you know, the Census Bureau is really the oldest gather, uh, data gathering agency in the United States government. So it's authorized and mandated in the Constitution. So in the Constitution of 1787, you know, finally ratified in 1788, it said we're going to do a census account every 10 years. Uh, and the main purpose in the Constitution of doing that count is to redistrict Congress, to figure out how many people live in the states, and then for to tell the states you are allowed three members of the House or 32 members of the House or one member of the House, you need to figure out what your districts are. So that happens every 10 years. And it is specifically linked to geographic areas like states and their sub-entities. The, the, 
decennial census is a complete head count. It strives to count the entire population in a way that is the most accurate possible. I mean, when the census started, when we had a population of 3 million, we had people who would go door to door, knock on the door and record who lived there. Um, that continued really for well over a century and we still have census workers that go out and do sampling. But typically now the full, the full census is done by uh, a mailer. Um, and so we count numbers of people along with selected characteristics. And I thought this was just fun. Uh, I actually I looked this up on the Census Bureau website, uh, how the census has changed. And this is an index of the questions. Um, this was the 1790 question. This was it. There, these one, two, three, four questions were asked in the 1790 census. Um, so that was actually the constitutional purpose, just counting people. And so these were the questions that were asked those questions there. Compare that to 1860, the year prior to the Civil War, and we see these 14 questions, including some that we would find quite offensive today, right? Um, and we were asking questions like this in 1860. We were asking questions like this in 1860. We were asking questions like this in 1860. We still ask some of these same questions. The point is that the questions have varied a lot and allowed the Census Bureau really to grow as a reliable source of a lot of information about the United States. So there, the census has other, other censuses that it does besides the decennial census. There's the American Community Survey. The American Community Survey is based on a statistical sampling methodology that is done all the time whereby people uh, are sent very short postcards and asked to fill them out and then the ACS is actually used to do not only population estimates but other estimates as well in the interim period between the decennial censuses. There are some others that are very important. The current population survey which is conducted monthly um, and talks about various uh, aspects of population demographics and preferences. The census of governments, which is used a lot uh, in public administration, that's done every five years and years that end in two and seven. The economic censuses, same years. Then there are county and zip code business patterns and surveys of income and program participation, and then annual population estimates. So all of these things are done by the Census Bureau, so it has grown immensely from the every 10-year census. So what is the census data based on? It's based on geographic areas. So we have legal and administrative geographic areas in the United States, right? So we have the nation, we have states, we have counties, we have places, we have townships. That is a hierarchy there. Um, that is a, a legal administrative hierarchy from nation to state to county to place to township. Then we have other administrative areas such as school districts, legislative districts, tribal areas, and territories. And then contrasting to that, we also have statistical areas. So we have large areas, which are called uh, metropolitan statistical areas and micropolitan statistical areas. So for example, Omaha, Nebraska, is counted as part of Douglas County, Nebraska, but it is also an SMSA where that includes Council Bluffs, Iowa. So the statistical area includes two uh, state legal entities, whereas the city itself is a legal entity of Douglas County, Nebraska. And then we have small areas such as census blocks, um, such as census blocks, groups, etc., cetera, and uh, zip codes and voting districts. Sorry about that. So we see the Omaha metropolitan area includes three counties in Iowa as well. The Sioux City, Iowa area includes two counties in Nebraska and one in South Dakota. So these statistical areas 
uh, are don't really respect state boundaries per se. Uh, they actually include the, the metropolitan area. And then we have micropolitan areas such as the North Platte micro, the Scotts Bluff micro. Um, and so these are statistical areas because uh, over time, it became clear that this these were the settlement patterns in the United States, which transcended, if you will, legal boundaries. So just a real uh, quick primer, and I'd like to make a pitch here for um, for CPAR, the uh, our entity in CPACS, which is the Center for Public Affairs Research. Uh, I talked about last week. They they uh, hold a Census Data Users Conference once a year in August. Um, they have another one coming up this year. It's not one that we send students to. It's one that we actually charge admission for. It's a few hundred dollars. I think it's about $250, something like that. Um, but they really teach people how to use the census. And your agency may be able to send someone at a fee. Um, if that's if using census data for your agency is something you'd be interested in, you might want to check with CPAR and ask about that. So the census block, um, or the census block is the, the smallest building block of how the census does its business. So you can see here, this is actually a census block, block 2022, right at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, this small strip of land. Um, and so it's bounded by actual physical features like roads and streams. And then from the block, we get a, a block group. So this is block group two in Douglas County. Um, and it this consists of several blocks. And then from the blocks, we get what is called the census tract. And so this is usually, this is usually the smallest entity that people usually refer to when they're talking about census data is a census tract. And this actually does become useful for people like businesses who want to know things like what's the median family income in census tract 47 of Douglas County. Um, that might help them determine where they want to build. And so that's a terrible, awkward transition, but this is um, this is this exercise. So what I'd like you to do after you you read this lecture after you listen to all the demos is I would like you to create your own Microsoft Excel or other readable spreadsheet um, in a presentable fashion that you might actually include in a policy analysis or some other report and I want you to have information on these political units and you see I list them there the United States Colorado Iowa Kansas Missouri Nebraska South Dakota and Wyoming I want you to use data from the years 2007 and 2012. And on this spreadsheet, I want you to list those, those items that I have there, A through G. The population of the state for the applicable years, the state GDP for the applicable years in current or nominal dollars, the state GDP in the applicable years in constant dollars, 2012 dollars, the per capita GDP for the applicable years, which you would derive from the population and the GDP itself, in constant dollars, the dollar amount of elementary and secondary school funding that is provided by federal sources, by state sources and by local sources in both nominal and 2012 dollars, then the percentage of elementary and secondary school funding provided by those sources, and finally the per capita dollar amount of tax taxes in current dollars and 2012 dollars for each state um, for the applicable years. Okay, so where are you gonna get all that information? You're going to get all that information from the census, from the VEA, and the BLS. Um, use the demos I provided you, um, but you will have to do some work on your own. The demos actually don't answer all those questions for you. Um, they give you a start. So you will have to do some uh, searching in those three websites, and then you will have to design a spreadsheet that answers those questions. And so I'm asking you to insert that on the discussion board. Um, make the make your attachment something that you would actually include excuse me on a report uh, you could do that by copying it and putting it on a word document and attaching it but be creative here and I'm looking forward to those results thanks very much